Well, welcome to Holy Trinity and St Saviour's Sermons. Here we seek to live life to the full and I hope this sermon inspires you to do exactly that. The reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 9, <clears throat> verse 2 and then verses 6 to 7. So Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. In verse 6. But to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the word of the Lord. So before we start, um, let's just pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we know that Christmas is coming, and we rejoice that Jesus was born, and we pray that you will help us this morning as we think about the wonderful things you've done, and the wonderful hope that you give us, and the peace. And may you be with us as we reflect on the readings we've just had, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we've had some good news with Pauline, but unfortunately, every time we turn on the television, it's not so good news. And uh, it looks as though our nation is struggling at the moment, and we seem to be in a dark place with little hope. Unfortunately, lots of promises are being made, and we wonder whether these promises will be fulfilled. Let's hope they will. But let's have a look at some of the pressing situations first and um, see what we can do to help. Winds have been blowing, there's been heavy rain and snow. And we're reminded that our planet is in trouble. 200 world leaders met at COP26 two weeks ago and they wanted to see what they could do to save the planet. There were plenty of good words, but unfortunately limited promises at the end. But then, how is it possible for the whole world to agree when some of them are at war fighting each other? Greta Thunberg had a viewpoint on this, and she said it's all blah, blah, blah probably right. But hold on a minute. It's not all about governments and leaders, is it? It's about us as well. We've all got something to contribute. We can all do something to save the planet. A change of thinking is required. And that includes you and it includes me. And then we've got the COVID strain. Even the last couple of days, we've heard there's a new strain which is threatening to go all over the world. Promises are being made as to how it can be dealt with. But can we really expect governments and scientists to do it all for us? Surely we've got a responsibility as well. We need to protect other people, we need to protect ourselves with vaccinations, wearing masks and social distancing. A change of thinking is required on our part. Then what about racial prejudice? That seems to be big in our news at the moment. There are lots of promises about this and how it can be changed. They seem to be hollow in some cases. Yes, laws and opportunities can change. 
We want everyone to have an equal chance. But then what about the prejudice that's going on in our heads? Again, a change of thinking is required. It shouldn't just be our words or our actions, it should be what's going on inside our head as well. And then sadly there are unscrupulous people who promise refugees a better way of life in England and then take their money. Their promises are empty and corrupt. We think of desperate people trying to cross the English Channel in flimsy boats. We think of people starving in Afghanistan. And we realize something is very wrong with our world. It's a dark place. And yes, governments sh should be doing something. But surely we should be receiving refugees. We should give, give them kindness and support. We should help them somehow to find a new life. We should share something of the wealth we have with them. You know, it could have been us born in Africa or Middle East where the trouble is. A change of thinking is required by us. 2,800 years ago, the people of Israel were finding things hard as well. Isaiah was a prophet in Israel. And the northern part of Israel had been invaded by the Assyrians, which is the Assyrians now... Iran and Iraq. And it looked like the rest of Israel was going to be invaded too. And then a man called Hoshea decided he would delay things for a few years by murdering the king of Israel. And then he took over the country and turned it into a vassal state to Assyria. But that wasn't going to last. It was now crunch time. The people were about to lose everything, and soon they would be taken into slavery. So what should they do? What should we do today? Sadly, the people of Israel decided to ignore God. They turned to mediums who promised to consult the dead on their behalf. Their promises were empty. And so the people were left truly walking in darkness with no hope. We all hope for things to be better in the future, don't we? But none of us are free of making empty promises. So often laziness, indifference, selfishness get in the way. We have every intention of doing something to help people but we never seem to get round to it. In any event, some of the issues seem to be so big, they're beyond us, it's too much for one person to handle. The problem is that trying to do things on our own, in our own strength, with our own wisdom, just doesn't work. That's what they were doing in Israel years ago. I think possibly we're trying to solve our problems today using our own wisdom and our own minds. I've always had great respect for Mother Teresa. She had many quotes during her lifetime and they were all based on two things. First of all, her immense love of God but also her desire to serve and help those who were poor and less fortunate than herself. One of her quotes said that we ourselves might feel that our contribution is just a drop in the ocean. But the ocean will be much worse if our drop is missing. Then she also said, I alone cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone across the water to create many ripples. So we can make a difference, and God wants to help us. So 
so let's make sure we give it a try. Isaiah gave some good advice to the people of, of Israel. He said, why are you trying to consult the dead when you should be consulting the living God who can really help you? And in Isaiah, Isaiah 9, he looks ahead to the coming of the Messiah. He says there will be real change. He says the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on the living, on those living in the land and the shadow of death. So he was looking ahead and seeing great light coming. And we know that Jesus fulfilled this prophecy. If you look in John 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And Isaiah also forecasts the qualities of the Messiah when he will come. <coughs> he said, for unto us a child is born, to us the son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be a wonderful counsellor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. As you know, today is the first Sunday in Advent, and we look forward with joy to the coming of Jesus on Christmas Day. God made a promise all those years ago that a new king would be born. And he's kept that promise. He's not let us down. And he promises he will always be there. His promises are not broken. He wants to bring light and happiness and change to a world which is a dark place. And he wants to use us to help in the process. God is well aware of the challenges we all face. And I think he's always been saddened to see the things that human beings have done to each other and to his world. And so he came. He chose to come. He didn't have to come. He chose to come to be born as Jesus on Christmas Day. We look forward to that. Jesus wants to offer us comfort and strength in all of our situations. He offers us salvation from our sins and a better way of living so we can bring real change to our world. As I thought about the birth of Jesus, the three things came to my mind. Firstly, Jesus was born humbly in a stable. There was nowhere else for him to go. He could have been born in a palace, but he chose instead to come in this way. And he did that so everyone can identify with him. Not one person cannot identify with him. And Jesus was born in these poor circumstances. His birth was announced to a, a young girl who wasn't yet married. He chose to be born in a country which was occupied by the Romans, and that meant there were many refugees. He came to a place where it would not be easy for him. <coughs> so that was the first point. The second thing that came to me is that Jesus didn't come to do everything for us. Nor did he come to take away our free will. And he didn't come to take away the difficulties which we have created as human beings. It's not God's intention that we should become puppets. Instead, he wants to change our hearts, to bring us hope, encouragement, peace, so that we, in turn, can pass that on to other people and make the world a better place. So Jesus came and he didn't do everything for us. 
actually helps us to bring change. The third thing that came to my mind is that Jesus had no security. He didn't amass possessions like we do for his own comfort. He lived humbly. He trusted God the Father for his well-being each day. And in Luke 9, we read, foxes have holes. That's what Jesus said. Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And Jesus wasn't even secure as a baby as he and his parents had to flee to Egypt to avoid Herod, King Herod, killing him. So as Jesus had no security, his security was in God alone. And let's now have a look at those various qualities that Isaiah quoted that the Messiah would have. Because in doing that, we can see the qualities of Jesus. And that will help us to understand who Jesus is. And it will encourage us to pass on some of these qualities to other people. So the Messiah was the wonderful counsellor. A counsellor is someone who gives good advice, who advocates for others. And in John 14 and John 16, Jesus says that he will come again as the Holy Spirit. He'll come and dwell in our hearts. He will guide us in truth and the way forward. He will bring us encouragement and comfort. And in the Acts of the Holy Spirit, as we, Acts of the New of the apostles, we see how the Holy Spirit actually came and filled the apostles and equipped them to do the job he'd given them. And he will equip us in the same way. So he is a wonderful counsellor. And then he is mighty God. And we know that God is all-powerful in all things. Nothing is too difficult, nothing is too impossible for him. And in John 15, Jesus says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you will ask for anything you wish, and you shall have it. And we note there that we are to remain in Jesus, and his words are to remain in us. So we've got mighty God, the wonderful, powerful person who can bring change. And then we've got eternal father. God our father is outside of time and so is Jesus. And he's always waiting, waiting there to work with us. It doesn't matter if we feel inadequate or if we feel weak. In fact, the weaker we are, the more God can use us, the more he can strengthen us. And the eternal father goes on beyond death too. He's there forever, in life and in death. And when he comes, when Jesus comes again, there'll be a trumpet sounding and we'll all be raised up to dwell with our Lord. We'll be with God in heaven forever. So the eternal father is always going to be there. It's sometimes us that separates ourselves from him. And we know that death is just a transition, it's not the end. <clears throat> and then we've got the Messiah as the Prince of Peace. And Jesus said, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives to me, gives to you rather. I do not give you to give to you as the world gives, gives to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. We know, don't we, that Jesus didn't come as a warrior king. He came to live in our hearts and our lives, to bring peace so that we have peace, so that we're encouraged, and then we in turn can bring peace and change to the lives of others and justice. 
Jesus wishes to be king of our hearts. He wishes to bring us peace so that others will have peace too. So as we look forward to Christmas with joy in our hearts and hope, there's a challenge for us, isn't there? We look around us and we are in a hurting world. It's a world in a dark place which seems to have little hope. We can bring change. We can help make a difference. We might think that we can do it all in our own strength, but of course we can't. We need God's help. We need God to work with us through the power of his Holy Spirit. We need him to work within us and through us. We need him to help us to bring light to our world. So it's a better place, a place as God intends it to be. The title of our talk today is, Who Do I Need Jesus to Be? I think that's a right question to consider and we've thought about all the things that Jesus can be for us. But we also need to be very much at one with him. We need to be close to him. We need to receive the hope and the peace he gives us so we can pass that to others. So yes, it is good to consider who do I need Jesus to be. But I think we'd also be looking at the question, who does Jesus want me to be? And so we need to come close to him. We need to be more like him. We need to think like Jesus. And the birth of Jesus offers us amazing hope and light and love and peace to us and all places where there is need in our world. And it's not about human wisdom. If you read Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, you will see that God regards much of his human wisdom as foolishness. Much of the world's wisdom is foolishness. It will come to nothing. It will fade away. The wisdom and love of God, of Jesus, will not fade away. His promises remain firm. And so we need to come close to him, close to him each day, to allow him to lead us in the way he wants us to go. And that is referred to in Corinthians as having the mind of Christ. So, the offer's on the table. Are we going to accept God's help or go our own way and try and do things in our own strength or just let others do things? God's not going to do everything for us, but he offers us help by changing our minds, changing our way of thinking, changing our priorities in life, and that's what our world needs at the moment. Are we going to accept this challenge? The choice is ours. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, as we look ahead to the birth of Jesus at Christmas, we rejoice. The celebration. We're so grateful for the love and the peace and the hope that Jesus brings. So we pray that you will lift up each one of us, but also help us to live the Christian life, to go out and bring that peace and hope and love to others, to change our thinking and also the thinking of the world around us, so that we will come out of the darkness and see the light of Jesus. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do I need to adjust it or can you hear me now? Adjust it.
bend over. Right. Hello, everyone. How's that? Those of you that know me, bronze. Mm. Need to do slightly better than that, I feel. And silver as a target. Well, silver's first of the losers, so we'll be uh, aiming slightly higher than that. I've got seven minutes today because I'm allowed two minutes for a recap of last time. Woohoo! So, I asked you to take one of these away and fill it in three weeks ago. And uh, when you finish today's service, I want you to fill it in again and do a little bit of maths, but don't be too frightened by the maths. What I asked you last time was to stop thinking about energy as a cost and start thinking of it as how much energy am I consuming? Because the whole purpose of the exercise is for us to start looking at our own consumption. Give you a quick easy one. I could cut the electricity bill of this church by half by turning half the lights off. That would be the easiest 50% this church could ever save. But I also said I would look at my own consumption and I'd show you mine because I'm going to be looking at yours. So I, we live in a four bedroom house and reasonably well insulated. So just uh, I'll do the maths for you. No one has to do any thinking and I'll bring the important bit to your attention when we get there. 10.42 kilowatts. That's what I use, that's what we use every day of electricity in our house. 10.42, that's based over the last 26 days. Your sum is 21 days. So take your beginning energy meter reading, your electricity meter reading, take your end electricity meter reading, subtract one from the other, divide by 21, and see how it rates against my 10.42. You'll note I'm old school. I don't do PowerPoint presentations. I like to have a nice piece of paper that I know works. We pay 13p a kilowatt. I don't know how much you pay. You might pay more, you might pay less. Which means my daily electricity bill is £1.35. There's a standing charge. There's all sorts of other things added on. But my consumption is £1.35 a day. Now, I said I wasn't going to talk about cost, but this is the carrot. Because the great thing about this is when people start thinking about money, they tend to start thinking about it a little harder. Now, I pay 4p a unit for gas. My gas, uh, my gas meter says that my daily consumption is 2.37 units a day based on the last 26 days. Now some people, and I've met many of them, would therefore say that my electricity bill is £1.97 a day and I'm using just over two units of gas a day and only paying 4p for it. Therefore, my gas bill is going to be in the order of 10 pence. And therefore, I should focus all my efforts on saving electricity. 4p a unit. Well, what's, what's the point of that? They're almost giving it away. After all, we've got North Sea oil. We make our own gas. That's probably why it's so cheap. But 4p a unit is per kilowatt hour. That's not what your gas meter is telling you. Your electricity meter is telling you kilowatt hours. But your gas meter is telling you volume of gas. And it's not a kilowatt hour. There are two types of meter in the United Kingdom. There's a cubic feet. Most of us in this church will have the old meter saying cubic feet. If you look at your gas meter after today's service, and I implore you to do so, just have a look what meter you have. You might have a modern meter that says cubic meters. Cubic feet 
FT with a three on it, cubic meters, M with a three on it. On page five of your gas bill, in little hidden italics, is the calculation to change your meter into kilowatts, hours. And it's a staggering. One unit in an old meter is 31 kilowatts, hours. One unit on a metric meter is 11 kilowatt hours. So my 2.37 units is 74.3 kilowatt hours. 74.3 compared to my 10 kilowatts for electricity. Which equates to two pounds 97 a day. Ooh, now we're all thinking about it. That is my daily energy consumption, and I'm an energy nerd. Who's left their central heating on? Who's boiling water like a giant kettle for one shower to be taken, but you've actually heated 140 liters of hot water? The challenge for us as a church is to reduce our energy consumption. The benefit is we also save a lot of money doing it, but the challenge is to reduce our energy consumption. And to reduce our energy consumption, we firstly need to understand how we're consuming it. And the vast majority of people in this congregation will be consuming it mainly by gas. Bob gave us a tremendous reminder of COP26 regardless of what governments can do and regardless of what politicians can do we need to create less co2 personally and that means we need to burn less flame we need to stop creating co2 or reduce the co2 but we really need to stop it so my challenge to you is get back to your houses, have a look at your meters, and really understand where your consumption is. If you could fill in your form, doesn't matter over what period, you could start today if you want and do it over a week. The idea is that you have your daily consumption and somehow it gets back to me with your name on because that will be our baseline. And over the couple of weeks and months and I start talking to you and you start thinking about it and you start thinking about how much money, because by the way, gas prices today are 36p a kilowatt. So when we all come out of these protections, it won't be 4p, it will be significantly higher. So our challenge is to get our baseline right on our consumption and then we can see where we can go from there. So, positive, go for gold, we'll all be fine. Thank you.